Welcome back to the Berry Center and our Earth Day readings from my father's essay, Solving for Pattern. The second set of standards by which we might judge solutions to our agricultural and cultural problems that my father offers in his essay, Solving for Pattern. A good solution always answers the question, how much is enough? Industrial solutions have always rested on the assumption that enough is all you can get. But that destroys agriculture as it destroys nature and culture. The good health of a farm implies a limit of scale because it implies a limit of attention and because such a limit is invariably implied by any pattern. You destroy a square, for example, by enlarging one angle or lengthening one side. And in any sort of work, there is a point past which more quantity necessarily implies less quality. In some kinds of industrial agriculture, such as cash grain farming, it is possible, to borrow an insight from Professor Timothy Taylor, to think of technology as a substitute for skill. But even in such farming, that possibility is illusory. The illusion can be maintained only so long as the consequences can be ignored. The illusion is much shorter, lived when animals are included in the farm pattern, because the husbandry of animals is so insistently a human skill. A healthy farm incorporates a pattern that a single human mind can comprehend, make, maintain, vary in response to circumstances, and pay steady attention to. That this limit is obviously variable from one farmer and farm to another does not mean that it does not exist. A good solution should be cheap, and it should not enrich one person by the distress or impoverishment of another. In agriculture, so-called inputs are, from a different point of view, outputs, expenses. In all things, I think, but especially in agriculture struggling to survive in an industrial economy, any solution that calls for an expenditure to a manufacturer should be held in suspicion, not rejected necessarily, but as a rule, mistrusted. Good solutions exist only in proof and are not to be expected from absentee owners or absentee experts. Problems must be solved in work and in place with particular knowledge, fidelity, and care by people who will suffer the consequences of their mistakes. There is no theoretical or ideal practice. Practical advice or direction from people who have, who have no practice may have some value, but its value is questionable and is limited. The divisions of capital, management, and labor characteristic of an industrial system are therefore utterly alien to the health of farming, as they probably also are to the health of manufacturing. The good health of a farm depends on the farmer's mind. The good health of his mind has its dependence and its proof in physical work. The good farmer's mind and his body, his management and his labor, work together as intimately as his heart and his lungs. And the capital of a well-farmed farm, by definition, includes the farmer, mind and body both. Farmer and farm are one, an organism. Once the farmer's mind, his body, and his farm are understood as a single organism, And once it is understood that the question of the endurance of this organism is a question about the sufficiency and integrity of a pattern, then the word organic can be usefully admitted into the series of standards. It is a word that I have been defining all along, though I have not used it. An organic farm, properly speaking, is not one that uses certain methods and substances and avoids others. It is a farm whose structure is formed in imitation of the structure of a natural system. It has the integrity, the independence, and the benign dependence of an organism. Sir Albert Howard said that a good farm is an analog of the forest which manures itself. A farm that imports too much fertility, even as feed or manure, is in this sense an inorganic, 
as a farm that exports too much or that imports chemical fertilizer. The introduction of the term organic permits me to say more plainly and usefully some things that I have said or implied earlier. In an organism, what is good for one part is good for another. What is good for the mind is good for the body. What is good for the arm is good for the heart. We know that sometimes a part may be sacrificed for the whole. A life may be saved by the amputation of an arm. But we also know that such remedies are desperate, irreversible, and destructive. It is impossible to improve the body by amputation, and such remedies do not imply a safe logic. As tendencies, they are fatal. You cannot save your arm by the sacrifice of your life. Perhaps most of us who know local histories of agriculture know of fields that in hard times have been sacrificed to save a farm. And we know that though such a thing is possible, it is dangerous. The danger is worse when topsoil is sacrificed for the sake of, sake of a crop. And if we understand the farm as an organism, we see that it is impossible to sacrifice the health of the soil to improve the health of plants, or to sacrifice the health of plants to improve the health of animals, or to sacrifice the health of animals to improve the health of people. In a biological pattern, as in the pattern of a community, the exploitative means and motives of industrial economics are immediately destructive and ultimately suicidal. It is the nature of any organic pattern to be contained within a larger one, and so a good solution in one pattern... Should I start at the beginning? Let me start at the beginning of that passage. <clears throat> It is the nature of any organic pattern to be contained within a larger one. And so a good solution in one pattern preserves the integrity of the pattern that contains it. A good agricultural solution, for example, would not pollute or erode a watershed. What is good for the water is good for the ground. What is good for the ground is good for the plants. What is good for the plants is good for animals. What is good for animals is good for people. What is good for people is good for the air. What is good for the air is good for the water, and vice versa. But we must not forget that those human solutions that we may call organic are not natural. We are talking about organic artifacts, organic only by imitation or analogy. Our ability to make such artifacts depends on virtues that are specifically human. Accurate memory, observation, insight, imagination, inventiveness, reverence, devotion, fidelity, restraint. Restraint, for us now, above all. The ability to accept and live within limits. To resist changes that are merely novel or fashionable to resist greed and pride, to resist the temptation to solve problems by ignoring them, accepting them as trade-offs or bequeathing them to posterity. A good solution, then, must be in harmony with good character, cultural value, and moral law.